So this morning, we're in our second last week in our series, The Armor of God, which is a focused on what Christianity refers to as spiritual warfare. The Bible teaches us that there is an invisible war going on behind the scenes that we cannot see. It's being waged by the forces of evil. And even though Christ has won the victory, which we celebrated last Sunday, there still remains a certain level of influence that the devil has in this world, at least until Christ comes again. And so there is a danger, even though Christ has total victory, there is a danger. And the biggest mistake that we can make is not being aware of it. And so what Paul did when he was writing the Ephesians, he gave them an encouragement so that they would not forget it. And actually, if you would, let's stand for the reading of God's word this morning. We'll be in Ephesians chapter six, starting in verse 10. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all the perseverance and making supplication for all the saints. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So every week in this series, we have been focusing on a different piece of armor. A different piece of armor that represents a different piece of truth that protects us against the enemy. And that's what spiritual warfare is. It is discerning and putting away the lies of the devil. Like I say this every week, we spend way too much time watching too many horror movies, reading too many mystical books about demons and the devil and all this evil, get us all hyped up over nothing. And I think the enemy loves that because we're distracted by the wrong things. Scripture is clear, the devil is a liar and the greatest impact that he can has on, on us is getting us to believe his lies. So that's what the whole armor of God is. It's a bunch of truth, one after another, that defeats every lie of the devil. So this week, we're focusing on the back half of verse 17. It says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So another piece of equipment that is crucial to every soldier is a sword which is a sword, which is a metaphor for the word of God. Now, the word of God can mean a couple things here. He can mean just the gospel, just the message of Jesus and salvation. It could also mean the Holy Scriptures. Now, I think in this context, Paul's talking specifically about the gospel, but I'm gonna widen my message this morning to include all of Scripture. First, because the writer of Hebrews also refers to Scripture is a sword. He says this in Hebrews 4, 12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the, what church? Of the heart. And secondly, because in reality, all of Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, it's all about the good news of Jesus Christ. It's all about the gospel. Some of us, we misunderstand what the Bible is. We think it's a book of good morals and, and good teaching, which are some of that is there. But that's not what the Bible is at its core. As Tim Keller said before he passed, it's not a book of virtues. It's a book of the gospel. It's a book of good news. A book of good news that was written by 35 to 40 different authors on three different continents. 
three different languages over a 1,600-year span that all come together to present one story of how God's incredible grace is displayed through his spirit and through his son despite the sin of man. Praise God for that. Now, Paul also refers to the sword as the sword of the spirit. And what does he mean by this? Paul here is speaking of the Holy Spirit, who is the third member of what Christians refer to as the Trinity. When Christianity, the Bible, refers to God, it's referring to three different persons, God the Father, God the Son and Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, who all have unique roles to play. It's not God who just like manifests as one and then he shows up as another. No, three individual personalities, for lack of a better phrase, makes up God. And the Holy Spirit, he is the one, as Jesus said, come to convict us of our sin, to make us aware of God's presence. It is only by him that God can dwell in us. He's the one who gives us the ability, as we talked about last week, to be obedient to God's word, to understand God's word. In fact, it was through the Holy Spirit that men could even write the word of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says, all scripture is breathed out by God and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. It says, it's breathed out by God. Or your version might say, God breathed, as I memorized it as a child. God breathed. Now that's not a phrase we normally use. You know, I don't, I don't go to my kids and I give them a list of chores. And when they complain, I say, quiet, it is dad briefed, right? You know, if my wife and I are talking about our finances. I don't go to Maria and say, look, this is what we're gonna do. It's husband briefed. Probably because I'd get backhanded if I tried that. It's, but it's like, it's not a phrase we use, right? It's weird. So what does that mean? Well, Peter kind of gives us an idea. He says this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. He says, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy, no teaching of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, what does that mean? It means that God directed human authors to write these books. And it's not a case of like Paul sitting there writing Ephesians and he goes, okay, God, what's next? Wait, can you say that again? How do you spell that one? What's it? I couldn't hear you. Speak up. No, it's not, it's not like that. These human authors, they, they use their personality, their experiences. They're, they're writing in their own style. That's one of the ways that we tell how books are written differently by the style that it's written. But all of them, Moses, David, Isaiah, John, Paul, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they all spoke while being carried along and directed by the Holy Spirit. It's like when I sit down to preach, I study the Greek, I study the Hebrew, I look at the context of the surrounding words to see whoever wrote that, what is, what is being shared, and, and, then, and then I'm praying. And, then, and you know this about Scripture, that like, there's a lot of truth that could be brought out of the same, the same verse, the same passage. And so I'm praying and I'm asking God, okay, what do I share this week? And I'll start writing and ideas and thoughts will come to my mind. And then I'll come here and I'll, and I'll have it written out before you. And then I'll speak. And then if you ever stick around for both my messages, if you're ever that blessed, um, you, you'll know that one message is never the same as the other. There'll be some core components, but there'll be certain things I hit on in one service and another. And, and it's like the Holy Spirit's directing me to hit certain people in that service with a certain piece of truth that wasn't needed in the other. You'll know this sometimes. You'll, have, you'll be talking to somebody. You'll be praying for somebody and like a thought or a word or something will be coming out from you and you're like, where did that come from? You're being carried along by the Holy Spirit. All right, so the point in all this is if we have the Bible, right, and if it is literally breathed out by God, then this is a, very powerful weapon God has given us in spiritual warfare. 
I, I told you about that book I love, which I know some of you bought, and you're like, you did not tell me it was this hard to read, uh, in the 1600s by Thomas Brooks, which is called Precious Remedies for the Devil's Devices. And it's literally an entire book of lies that Satan tries to sell you. And then it gives you biblical remedies to defeat that lie. I love it. Read it every day. Like when he tempts you to sin or he tempts you to apathy, or he tempts you to despair, or he attempts you with the conference of the world. I mean, if I asked you, would you like, you know, I said, I said to you, okay, would you like to stop giving in to temptation? Would you like to be able to say, I am diligent in serving God? Would you like to be able to say, man, I got joy even in bad situations instead of sadness? Would you like to be able to say, man, I am no longer distracted by the things of this world? Anybody who's put their faith in Jesus Christ should answer yes to all of those. Be like, yes, sign me up, show me how. It's right here, all of it, right here. This is the sword of the spirit that can destroy every single lie of the devil. Let me show you how powerful it is. We read this passage many times if you grew up in church. I'm hoping it hits us different today. We're gonna go to Luke chapter four right before Jesus begins his ministry, starting in verse one. It says, and Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. And for 40 days, being tempted by the devil, he ate nothing for those 40 days, which either means he ate nothing or he ate very, very little. And when they were ended, he was hungry. Man, some of you can relate to this. You know you're all hungry if you miss breakfast, get hangry and stuff, we, we get it, right? He was hungry. And the devil said to him, if you're the son of God, command this stone to become bread. Bread. Man, if it was me, I'd be like, forget bread. Hook me up with a cheeseburger, a little bacon on it. I'm telling you, I make myself hungry now. And here's how Jesus responded. He says in verse four, he said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. So then the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a, in a moment of time and said to him, to you I will give all authority and their glory for it has been delivered to me and I will give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. How did Jesus answer him? It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Verse nine, and then he took him up to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written that he will command his angels concerning to guard you. And on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. How does Jesus reply? Verse 12, and Jesus answered him. It is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to, your te to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time, which means he wanted to try again later. Okay, understand the context here. Realize the gravity of this. The greatest force of evil known in the universe comes to Jesus, offers Jesus everything his natural body could want, Greatest force of evil comes to him. And of all the things that Jesus could do to combat this, of all the laundry list of things at his disposal, he simply quotes scripture. That's it. That's his big answer. That's his response. He says, it is written. That's how Jesus fights against the devil. It is written. He simply quotes the book that sits on our shelf covered in dust. He, he chooses to quote the book that only 45% of self-proclaimed Christians actually read once a week or more. This is the sword. This is the weapon that he chose to swing against the greatest force of evil. Again and again and again until the devil gave up. Spurgeon said, let us fight Satan always with it is written. For no weapon will ever fight the arch enemy as well as Holy Scripture. If you sit here today 
and your faith is in Jesus Christ. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. He's forgiven me for my sins. I want to follow him. When's the last time you have said it is written? When you were tempted to sin, when you were tempted to despair, when you were tempted to disobedience, when you were tempted to apathy, when's the last time you said, you know what, it is written? When? He didn't try to reason with Satan. Last people we read in the Bible that tried that was Adam and Eve. We know how that worked out. He quoted scripture. I don't know about you, but I'm tempted to reason. I'm tempted to reason when problems come my way. Jesus says, it is written. I ask this question because if you're a Christian, you will defend the Bible as the word of God. But we struggle to treat the Bible as the word of God. It is written. Now, do you know why Jesus was able to to say it was written? This is going to seem very elementary, but because he had read it. He read the Old Testament scrolls. That was scripture for him at that time. Before the Gospels, before the letters. He had read it. He spent time in the temple studying this. You can read about this in Luke. He read it. Do you think any soldier ever walks into battle back in those times without his sword? No way. There's no way that he would forget it. But that is what we are doing as Christians when we do not read our Bible. How many messages have you heard on reading your Bible? Countless, right? I've heard countless. And yet still some of us, we don't pick it up. Spurgeon said again, never let it be suspected by anyone that God has recorded truth in his word in which you have never read. Well, some people will tell me, I get some of these responses, and I get this one usually from men. And by the way, I'm gonna give a couple excuses that people give me. Um, These are not excuses that have come from one person. I've got them many, many times over all my years of being a pastor. Probably a few of them I said myself, so I promise you I'm not trying to think of you when I say this, because I've heard it from other places. Um, Sometimes people tell me, well, I'm not good at reading. This guy, this is, guys love to give me this one. I'm not good at reading. There was a time you weren't good at driving either, but somehow you're driving now. Why? Because you put in the effort. You were willing to practice. You were willing to stick with it. I mean, let's be honest. If you sit here and you've said that before, I'm not good at reading or I I don't want to read. Just be honest with yourself. Be honest. What the real truth is, is you don't care to put in the effort. That is, that's the truth. You do not want to put in the effort. It's not important enough to you. Because if it was important enough to you, you'd practice reading. We find the energy and effort to put in things that we find important. So admit it to yourself. It's just not important enough to me. Stop lying to ourselves. There's time where I said, when I was young, I'm not good at reading. Well, I, was, I just wasn't, didn't want to put in the effort. That's what it is. Yeah. You know, Whatever you practice that, you get better at. I remember like, I think it was the Braveheart movie, you know, and young William Wallace, he got his uncle, uncle's sword for the first time and it was too heavy for him. And yet by the end of the movie, he's just like swinging around left and right. Why? Because he kept picking it up. He kept practicing at it. Whatever you practice at, you're gonna get better at, whether it's reading your Bible or not reading your Bible. Whichever you choose, you're gonna get better at if you continue to do it. And I'm not talking about, and I want to be clear, I'm not talking about listening to your Bible. Now, there's nothing wrong with listening to the Bible because there's actually some good apps and they have some really cool people on there reading that has some really cool accents that I wish I had. One guy with a great South African accent, accent, it's really good. Anyway, but listening should never be a substitute for reading. And here's why. You can't take notes when when you're listening. You can't highlight when you're listening. You can't stop and ask questions of the text when you're listening. You're less likely to stop and let the the text ask questions of you. You're usually doing it while you're doing something else, so you give it partial focus. And you're less likely to stop and deal with God in the moment. You want to listen? Great. Listen why you read. 
Sometimes that's a great aid for people who struggle with reading. You listen while you read, but it should never take the place of reading God's word. Some people tell me I, I fall asleep when reading. You ever said that, I fall asleep when reading? Okay, so here are your options. Option one, you can give in to the fact that you fall asleep when reading and you can put away the weapon that Jesus used to defeat the lie of Satan. That's your one, that's your one, your option. I don't recommend that option, but it's an option. Or option two is you can put in the effort to figure out a different way to read your Bible. Read standing up. Read standing up on one leg. Read walking short distances, not far distances, so you don't walk into things. Read at a different time of day. Ask God for help and wisdom. Or go see a doctor, because if you, anytime you go to read anything and you fall asleep right away, there is something wrong. Right? Like either, either you got to get something checked or you're living wrong. Okay. Once again, just admit it. You don't want to put in the effort. It's not important enough. That may be offensive to some of you, but it's the truth. Because if you wanted to put in the effort, you'd come to me. So I'll pray for me. Pray for me with this. Help me with this. Give me ideas to this. You'd go to somebody for help and not just give up. Some will say, I just don't have the time. This one is easy. Give me your phone. There's a great little feature on your phone that tells me how many minutes you've spent in each app on your phone. You want to get convicted of time? Open that bad boy up. I remember the first time I was like, I just don't feel like I have time to read my Bible. I opened up my phone. This was years ago. And it's like, you spent four hours on Facebook this week. I'm like, oh, man. Okay? Tell me how much time you're watching on TV. Take a week. I want you to record it. Record every minute that you watch of TV in a week. I guarantee you, there's the time. You're just not making it the priority. And I know some of you, especially if you have like a bunch of kids, ladies at home, like, you know, you have no time to read the Bible unless you lock your children in a closet, which I'm not suggesting, by the way. Uh, but listen, even if you like, let's say you got into the Bible app, right? And I can help you so in you version, right? You get in there, you make Echo Lake your home church, I add you as a friend, then I add you to our New Testament a year program where you're literally reading one chapter a day. It takes like 10 minutes if you just read it through. Now, it would be nice if you took the time to post a comment or ask a question in the chat section or pray over that truth for your day because that's what we should be doing, praying and carrying it with us. But like even if you just read it, you're squeezing out. It's like 10 minutes. You can't find a way to get away from your kids with 10 minutes? Read it with them. Get one of the children Bible books, the ones with the cute little pictures and stories in them. I still like those. Read it with them. There's still a truth in there for you. Sometimes we need those elementary truths before we need the deeper ones anyway. And I'll tell you right now, if you ever feel, I remember I used to come into the church. I've told you this before. And every day I come in, I have a choice. I come in a little bit early before I get going and I can go straight to my office when I come in the door. Or I can come in here and I can read my Bible. And I used to feel like I was so busy that I had to go in there and start studying. And what I found is that when I make the choice to take the 10 minutes, the 15 minutes to stop and read my Bible and pray on it, I actually find myself being more productive. Why? Because it changes my perspective. Because we have all of these sense of urgency in our lives and we have all these things that we feel have to be done. Doom, doom, doom. So we rush through them all. And God will, through his Holy Spirit and his word, he clarifies things for you. Go, shows you the things you thought had to be done and are so important, so timely, are not necessarily the most important to his kingdom. And I found myself, I'm getting more things done. And I'm finding peace in the things that I don't get done because they're not quite as important as I thought. Because I think the devil would love nothing more than to distract us with hurry and with rush. Now, I want to give you a question. And if you can answer this question, it is literally the most important question to ensure that you would read your Bible every day. There'll be no greater question right here. So pay attention. It's only for this. And that question is, what is your prompt to pick up the Bible? What is your prompt to pick up the Bible? Everything we do is prompted by something, okay? You're getting ready to go to work. That is your prompt to find your keys. 
When I get dressed in the morning, that is my prompt to look up the weather app and to find out what I can to dress like that day, how warm, how cold, rainy, whatever. What is your prompt for reading the Bible? If you do not have one, you will fail at reading your Bible, most likely, unless you have all the time in the world. My prompt is the first thing that I walk into my office each day, I start, first thing I do is turn on the light, sit down, read my Bible before I open up my laptop, because once I open up my laptop, I get into work, and, and then it's done. And then I memorize my scriptures. When I'm home on Mondays, my day off every week, first thing I do, get dressed, I eat breakfast, then I sit on my couch, usually while Ella crawls all over me, and I read my Bible. Those are my prompts. And as long as I keep those as my prompts, I will keep reading the Bible. If I ever give those up as my prompts, I'll probably stop reading the Bible. I'll get inconsistent again. If you do not have a prompt for reading the Bible, it is hard to stay in a consistent pattern of reading it every day. You must have a prompt. If you take nothing else from this entire time, nothing else, figure out what your prompt is for reading the Bible. That is how you swing with the sword of the Spirit. You read it. You also have to do a little bit more than that. You have to believe what you read. Jesus believed what he said to Satan. Otherwise, he wouldn't have said it. And listen, if you sit here today as a new Christian, or maybe you're still trying to figure out what God is, you have to realize something. Whether you understand this or not, you give something in your life or somebody the last word in everything. In every situation, in every problem, there is somebody that is the final arbiter of truth for you. It could be your parents, could be culture, could be friends, could be community, could be your feelings, it could be your romantic partner, your job, politics, whatever. There is something that no, when it push comes to shove, that's where you go for decision making. That's where you go for your perspectives and your feelings. Whatever it is, what is the final arbiter of truth in your life? Don't say it's scripture if you don't actually go to scripture. This is where I go back to us saying, yeah, we say it's the word of God, but we don't really treat it like the word of God. When there's two opposing views, where do you go? And this is a question not just for adults, it's for the young people, for students. We go to school and we're surrounded by all of these people that, the, that they're the same age of us and that have somehow all these years of endless wisdom. Do you remember how wise you thought your friends were growing up? Right? Your parents were morons when you got to school because your friends had endless wisdom that they were so confident in. And it's only as you got older, you're like, oh my goodness, what, who was I listening to? I talk to my kids about this all the time. The, one of the best patterns you can start as a young person is you gotta decide where are you gonna go for truth? Where's the final place you turn to? Now, some people will be like, I don't believe in all that Bible stuff. It's old. Okay, old doesn't change if something's true or not. Grass is green. That's an old revelation. It's still true. True is true, regardless of time. And I find most people, they say, I don't believe in the Bible. I'll be like, okay, what do you believe in? Well, I don't know. I kind of just this or that. Or... And I'm like, okay, how can you be sure that this is not the final arbiter of truth unless you're sure something else is? If you ask a Christian what the final arbor truth is, they should say scripture. But we don't really mean it if we don't really turn to it. And then believe what it says above the lies and everything else. Now some of us, we believe it, we read it, but we just, we don't know it. We don't understand it. And so we give up on it. I've gotten this a lot. Oh, I just can't, I can't, I can't get it. And I'm like, okay, well, first of all, stop reading Leviticus as the first book you're going through, okay? Start in the, the gospel. Start there. Don't start in the beginning. Start at the gospels because you can't understand the old until you understand the new. 2 Timothy 2.15 says this, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. 
Now, some of scripture is hard to say. Even Peter says this. Peter, when writing about the words of Paul, he's like, man, some of this is tough to understand. Like, some of scripture is hard. But we have endless resources out there for us to help us get an understanding. You got the www.gotquestions.org. I always take, send people there. Now, I've not read every question on that website, but every question that I've read, I've either agreed with, or if I've disagreed with it, they write it in such a way that it's not a foundational truth that's worth being angry about. There's the Blue Letter Bible app that some use, and it has little, uh, little commentaries mixed into it that you can look up verses, which literally take you like two minutes. Or you really want to go big, there's the Logos Bible software, which is what I use. And it's like a, a program you buy, and then you can buy all the individual books and commentaries you want into it. And it's on your phone, or it's on your computer. You can read Greek. You can read Hebrew if you want to. Or you can just get little explanations of Scripture. The point being, I'll help you, I'll help you find all of that later if you want to. We have no excuse not to understand Scripture or to understand the possibilities of Scripture outside of laziness or apathy. I have no doubt there are people in this church who be, should be teachers of God's word now. But for over the courses of years and decades, they have not put the effort into understanding to knowing God's word. The good news is it's never too late. Because there are going to be false teachers that come along, and if you don't understand God's word in his context, they're going to be so passionate, so exciting, have such wonderful stories that you will get carried away. In fact, uh, I don't have time to go into it, but one of the verses that Satan posed to Jesus back in Luke, it was from Psalm 91, and he was actually quoting it a bit out of context. Jesus, but Jesus knew the context. He's like, don't throw that at me. If you do not know the context of Scripture, you will get led astray. It is amazing the things that people get carried away by that the Bible literally either will talk against or the context will blow apart what they're saying, but they'll pick out one verse because, because we don't know the context, we'll follow along. Passion and enthusiasm doesn't make something right. I mean, I could stand up here and I can go, grass is green. And I also can walk over here and say, grass is purple. I said, the Lord has revealed to me grass is purple. It is purple because it reveals God's kingship. Scripture says it's purple, and I, and I can get excited, and I can have fireworks, and, and I can have smoke, and, and I can have light shows, and I can have likes, and people screaming, and I can merchandise, and all of this stuff. It doesn't change the fact of what's true and what's not. But you will get carried away if you do not understand Scripture. And that's why coming to church is so important because you're surrounded by other people who you can talk to and you can grow with. That's why youth group and small group is important because you have other people that you're walking and growing with. And it's because it's a place to ask questions. I cannot tell you the amount of times I've had people come up to me and apologize for asking a stupid question when it comes to the Bible. I know that when I first started learning the Bible, I'd go up to people and I'd be like, I'm so sorry, I know this is stupid. No, it's not. There's nothing that ever says any question about the Bible is stupid. I believe that's the, die of the die, a lie of the devil. He wants to shame us into asking things that we think we should already know so that we don't ask. Because when we ask, we learn the truth and we can apply it to our lives. It's important that we come to church. Now, sometimes we're sitting there, we're reading like the Bible reading plan, which I've been talking about, and we don't understand the whole chapter. Even me, sometimes I'm like, what is that again? You know what? Don't give up on it. Just take away what you can from it. Okay? When you go to read tomorrow, whatever, you know, tomorrow's probably, it's Luke something or another. I don't even remember what it is. Go and read it. You can't understand everything. It's okay. Tomorrow's Luke 17. Take away what you can from it and start there. Take that step, and the more knowledge will come. And then I think finally, last thing I want to tell you is just memorize it. There's a, there's a passage in, in uh, Acts 23. Paul's in, he's before the court of the high priest for preaching for scripture. 
and they, they slap him. They don't like what he's saying, so they order him to be slapped. And so the guy comes up and slaps him, and he responds in anger. And he said, God's going to slap you, you white-tombed wall or whitewashed wall, which basically says, you hypocrite. And then somebody leans into Paul and says, you know, that's the high priest. And, and, and Peter, and then, and then Paul changes differently. He, oh, he goes, oh, he goes, you know what? It's like he apologizes. He, because he, and he quotes Exodus, where it says um, that you shall not revile a ruler of thy people. In that moment, he's getting angry, which I love. I love to see Paul getting angry since he wrote a lot of the New Testament. And he's, and he's threatening a guy. He's probably about to lose it, lose his temper. And yet he's there to stand before these people and talk about God. And what's the one thing that gets control of his temper, of his scripture? Was it reasoning? Was it, come on, come on, get, get control of yourself, Paul, get control. No, it was scripture. Somebody, his scripture that he had memorized in his life and spoke out changed his heart. Scripture can do the same for us when we choose to memorize it, when we choose to know it. I mean, it, not memorizing Scripture, it's like training with a sword and then just leaving it at home when the battle comes. That's why I use the Bible memory app. Now, some people don't like the Bible memory app. They, they like different Bible apps for memorizing. There's like five or six. Get one. And if you don't use a smartphone, if you like the dumb phones, the old flip phones, if that's your thing, cool. Get paper and pen. I don't care what it is, but start getting scripture in your life. You're like, I don't know what to memorize. What are you going through? What are you struggling with? That's the place to start. Spurgeon said that properly memorized scripture, they're like a lossage for your throat that you stick under your tongue and you let it dissolve and it brings you comfort during the day. That when you memorize scripture, it's like that. It sits in your heart as you call it out, as you speak it in the moment. You struggle with contentment. Well, then that's when you bring up 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 7. says, godliness with contentment is great gain. For you brought nothing into the world and you're leaving with nothing. You take nothing with you. Or, or, or you're struggling with despair that you, you, you can't accomplish anything or you're up against something too big. Psalm 121, 2. It says, my help comes from the Lord, maker of the heaven and the earth. Man, God's there. He's going to give me the help I need. That is the power of scripture in your life if we would give the effort and the time. That's the sword that we swing against in spiritual warfare. It's declaring truth. I say this time and time again. We spend so much time in our life listening to ourselves, chewing on our past mistakes and our hurts, and we listen and we let them stew rather than speaking truth into our lives. What truth do you need to speak into your life? There's only one place to find it, the word of God. First Peter says that all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord will remain forever. That is the sword of the spirit. That is what will bring us a victory in our trials and our temptations if we would only pick it up and swing it.